Hello everybody, welcome to this lesson which is also part of the, the last lesson that we were talking about which is 3.7 trigonometric functions in the unit circle and this is probably the penultimate class in this subtopic. So today we're going to take a look at the amplitude and the period of more general trigonometric functions. What do I mean by this? I mean the following, guys. If you remember, I mean, you have been working on this, on this subtopic on your own quite a lot. Uh, I asked you to solve, uh, I asked you to solve this, or not to solve, to investigate about the, the amplitude and the period of the function sine of x and cosine of x. So if you did that, what you should have found is that the amplitude of this particular function, sine of x, is, is 1. Let me correct this. We're going to represent the amplitude by capital A and the period by capital T. So you must have found that the amplitude of this function is 1 and the period is 2 pi which is roughly 6.3, right? Since pi is about 3.15, about 3 when you multiply by 2, you get 6.3. This is the period of sine of x. And by the way, all examples that I'm going to give you in this, in this lesson, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be using sine of x for all the examples. Whatever knowledge we acquire today is going to be the same for cosine of x. Okay, so it's the same idea. Whether you use sine of x or cosine of x, you get the same. The amplitude and the period for cosine of x are going to be also 1 and 2 pi, which is about 6.3. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean that the amplitude of this function and the period of this function are these two numbers? Let's go to Desmos for a while. So. And here I have that function, f of x equals sine of x, which you drew in one of the exercises from the workbook, right? And you must have drawn something like this. Okay, this is, this is known as a periodic function. I'm going to talk a little more about period, about the concept of period in a moment. But you get the idea that what, what we mean by periodic function is basically something that repeats all along the x-axis. Okay, when you hear periodic function, what should come to your mind is a concept of uh, re re repetitiveness or re re repetition, right? It's, it's, it's the same thing, okay? For example, look at this. The function starts at zero, and then as x increases, you get this behavior of the function. The function increases until it, it reaches a, a top and then decreases, decreases, decreases until it reaches a valley and then it's going to increase again and it's going to reach this point, look from here to here you can see that we have this curvy line which is something like an S, can you see that? it's kind of like a horizontal S and from then on, from here onwards you're going to get the same behavior, look the same S, you see? And then from this point, you get the same behavior. Same S, the same S, the same S, etc. That's what we mean by periodic function, guys. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, in a moment about that concept. But so let's focus first on the on the amplitude. What do we what do we mean by the amplitude of the function sine of x? What we mean, guys, is basically how far in the y-axis how far the function goes okay like what is the what is the top and the top both in the positive direction and in the negative direction as we can see this is the the, the top the top uh, value of the function or the the greatest value of the function and it is actually one this is two this is going to be one if you see the function is bounded between one and minus one. It never crosses, the function never goes beyond one for uh, uh, for greater values or below minus one 
for lesser values. It always stays between one and minus one. If you can imagine something like a strip, like, um, uh, like it, a, uh, a dotted line right here on one and right here on minus one, what we can see is that the function always, always stays inside that strip. Okay, I, can, I cannot draw it right now because I have other stuff uh, uh, drawn in the, in the whiteboard. But uh, just imagine that. Just imagine a strip from 1 to minus 1. Shade that strip. And you can see that the function always stays within that strip. That's what we mean by the amplitude of a function. And it happens to be that the, that the amplitude for sine of x is 1. What we mean by that is that it doesn't go beyond 1 or below minus 1. That's what we mean. Okay. Let's go back here. Okay. So, um, and by the way, what, uh, what about the period now? What do we mean by the period being 2 pi? Let's go one more time to Desmos. So, remember, 2 pi is about 6.3. And what, I, what it means is what I already told you, right? Uh, if you begin at 0 and take a full run until 6.3, which is more or less this, this place, then after this point, you're going to get the same behavior for the function. Okay, this same, this same S, you see? So you, have, you are here now, and then you're going to get the same behavior. And then now at 2 po a 12 point, I don't know, 12.4 or something, you're going to get the same behavior every 2 pi. You're going to get the same behavior from the function. It's a repetitive behavior. That's what we mean by, by the period. And for sine of x, we know that the period is 2 pi. But uh, I will tell you something more about that concept in a moment. Okay. So now that we know this stuff, what would be the amplitude and the period of more general trigonometric functions? If you notice, guys, so far we have only talked about very simple trigonometric functions. In this case, just like this, right? f of x equals sine of x. There is nothing else like uh, multiplying the x or multiplying the whole function. Let me give you some other examples of things that could be more complex trigonometric functions. For example, what if I multiply this by 3? You see, f of x equals 3 times the sine of x. Or what if I multiply the, the input, like f of x equals sine of 2x. This is more complex than this. This is also more complex than this. What if I create something even more, much more complex? For example, 2 times the sine of x. Well, let me multiply x by some number. 3x minus 1. Can you see? It's basically, I mean, it's still a trigonometric function. It's going to still behave in the same uh, undulated uh, way, like so. But it's going to be more complex. It's going to be much more complex than, than, than the father or the, the parent function, okay? The original function. Okay. And we want to investigate the amplitudes and the periods of functions like this. That's what we want to know. I already know the amplitude and the period of this primitive function as well as for cosine. But what about this now? What about these types of functions? That's what I want to find out today. So, for example, I'm, I'm giving you these four examples. Uh, we're going to start easy today. I'm not going to give you very complex trigonometric functions. For example, what I mean is we're going to basically just multiply the function sine times a constant, like outside the function. Can you see it's 2 times the sine, 1 third times the sine of something, 3 times the sine of something, etc. So we're going to multiply outside the trigonometric function, and also we're going to multiply the input by some other constant. As you can see, in here I'm multiplying the input by 2, in here I'm multiplying the input by 1 half, and in here I'm multiplying by two thirds. We're going to start with these types of functions. In the next class, we can go uh, full throttle into something like, for example, something like this. Okay? 
it doesn't get much more complex than that. You can multiply, oops, I forgot the sign. 2 times the sign of 3x plus 1 minus 3. I don't know what I wrote before, but it's the same idea. So it doesn't get much more complex than this. You can multiply the sine function by some constant outside the sine. You can multiply the input by another constant. You can add a constant to the to the input like, like so. And finally, at the very end of all this process, you can add or subtract another constant outside the trigonometric function. So all of this is also a trigonometric function. And this is a more much more general function than just writing f of x equals sine of x. Although this is gonna conserve also the same behavior than this. Okay, in regards to behavior, they they are basically the same. Okay, so let's let's find out. So we have four examples, and I want to find the amplitude and the period of all of these trigonometric functions. Okay, let's first talk about the amplitude. For the amplitude, it's going to be very easy, in fact. Uh, let's go here. If you remember, guys, when we talked about transformations of functions, we talked about three types of transformations. The simplest one was translations, and then we talked about stretches, and then reflections. Okay, so remember, I hope you remember it, and if not, this is a reminder. If you have any function f of x, any general function, and you multiply that function by a constant c, what you're going to get out of this, out of this transformation, is going to be a vertical stretch of factor c. Let me remind you with these two examples. Uh, let's take this one. Suppose I give you this function, guys. f of x equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. So this is a, this is a function, okay? And what's going to happen to the function, graphically, I mean, if I multiply it by 2? If f of x is equal to this, and I multiply f of x by 2, which is going to be this, can you see? What's going to happen? What's going to happen to the to the graphical behavior of this function? And conversely, if I have the same function but now I multiply by one half, which is a, a lesser number than than two, okay? What's going to happen to the graphical behavior of this function? Let's find out. We'll try to remember this function. Let's go to Desmos. Okay, look at this function. It's the same I, I wrote before. f of x equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. And this is its graph. It's half a circle or half a half circumference, like so. Okay? Now, look at these two other functions whose graphs I have not yet drawn here. If I click in here, the graphs are going to appear. So this one, g of x equals 2 times the square root of this. It's basically the same as this, only multiplied by 2, right? So basically, g of x is equal to 2 times f of x, because all of this stuff is f of x. So this should represent a vertical stretch of factor 2. And what that means, guys, if you remember, is this. Can you see? We're stretching the original graph by a factor of 2 in the vertical axis. This is g of x, and this is the original f of x. And all g of x is doing is multiplying, as you can see, multiplying all of this, which is f of x times 2. And this is what, this is the behavior that you get out of that mathematical manipulation. Now, on the other hand, what's going to happen if you multiply by a number which is less than 1, as in h of x equals 1 half times all of this, which is f of x. Well, as you maybe are guessing, if you, what, what this is going to do is a vertical stretch also, but a factor 1 half. 
and what that's going to produce is a compression of this graph. Try to imagine what's going to come out of this. Ready? There you go. It's a, it, this is also a vertical stretch, but of factor one half. And you can think of this as a compression. You can think of this as a, as a proper stretch or an elongation. And you can think of this when the number when the number is less than one, as in one half. You can think of it as a compression, but both can be called stretches. A stretch of factor two, a stretch of factor one half. Okay, so that's that's how it worked, if you remember, guys. So the same is gonna happen here, right? I mean, look at the look at what we have. We have uh, if I know that for this particular function sine of x, the amplitude, let me draw the graph very quickly. There you go. This is sine of x, let's suppose that. And sine of x is between the number one, this is the number one, and the number minus one. This is minus one. The, the, the function always, always, stays under under these two lines or under uh inside this strip what's going to happen now when i multiply sine of x times two what i expect is a stretch of this curvy line and what i expect out of this is now that my since i'm going to stretch this function by a factor of two what i'm going to get now is this the same behavior only than only that between the the lines two this line which is y equals two and the line y equals minus two two and minus two so i expect basically an elongation like so okay if i could draw let me try to draw the this same graph in the same Cartesian place so that you understand the, the difference. I'm gonna get these guys. It's gonna go up to two and then minus two. It's gonna look like this. And just for confirmation, just so that you see properly what I'm talking about, let's actually draw that graph in here. There you go. This is it. Two times the sine of x. Let's see how it's gonna look. There you go. Can you see? It's basically the same function, only that between the lines y equals 2 and y equals minus 2. It's elongated by a factor of 2. It's stretched by a factor of 2. And the same is going to happen if I multiply by any other number. If I multiply by numbers less than 1, which in this case, for example, we have 1 half, I expect a sort of like a compression like that. Can you see? Original function, stretched function by a factor of one half. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, it means basically, guys, that the amplitude of all of these functions, all of these functions, one, two, three, and four, is basically this number that is multiplying the, uh, the primitive or the most simple trigonometric function. We have 2 times the sine function. And since the sine function, since the amplitude of the sine function is 1, then now the amplitude will be 2 times 1, which is 2. So the amplitude is 2. And the same for the rest. This is going to be 1 third. The amplitude of all of these will be 3. And the amplitude of all of these will be 4. So the amplitude basically is the number that multiplies the sine function right in uh, right in front of it like okay like so all of these numbers right in front of the sine function so there you go that's how you that's how you find the amplitude of all of this let's let's work out another example very quickly for example i can write another function let's call it i don't know t of x and I'm going to multiply 5 times sine of x. There you go. So as you can see, 
we have the original function whose amplitude is 1 times 5. So I'm going to go up to 5. Can you see? And if build uh, up to minus 5. And this function, this blue function, will stay between that strip, between 5 and minus 5. So that's how it works. So for the amplitude, it's very simple. It's just these numbers that multiply the sine function. And we're done, basically. Now let's talk about the period. Let me make a little pause so I can draw some other stuff on the on the whiteboard and I'll be back with you. So we continue guys and now let's talk about the period. What is the period guys? Take a look at this function. This function f of x. I'm not telling you what function this is like I'm not giving you the uh, algebraic expression that could produce such a function. It doesn't matter. This is a function perfectly okay. The, the fact that I'm not telling you that this is equal to, I don't know, 2x sine of x or something like that doesn't make any difference. Okay, what is the, what is the particular characteristic of this function, guys? When you uh, contrast it or when you observe this and also uh, observe all the other functions that we have talked about, for example, linear functions, or quadratic functions, or you know, uh, functions of square roots, which are something like this, etc. So, what is the defining the defining difference between a function like this and all of these other functions? Well, it's very simple to see that the character or the behavior of this function, once again, is repetitive. Can you see? I mean, basically, we have this behavior like up and down and then up and down up and down up and down etc etc for all the x-axis basically if we understand a little part of the function which in this case goes from 0 to 4 which is this up and down basically by understanding how the function behaves in this way we have an understanding of all of the other all of the rest of the behavior in, uh, either to the left or to the right of this function. That's what, uh, in very uh, you know vague terms, that's what the, the uh, periodic function means. It's it's basically being re re uh, re repetitive over a certain period. Okay. For example, look at look at this uh, kind of like table that I'm giving you, in which I'm telling you the values of the function for specific values of x. Remember that these are the inputs, these are the, the values for the x, and these are the outputs. So for example, if you analyze this function, for x equals 0, we have 0. There you go. For x equals 1, we have 1. For x equals 2, we have 2, which is this point. For x equals 3, we got 3. And for x equals 4, we go back to 0. Can you see? For x equals 4, we go back to 0, and then the whole thing starts all over again, both to the right and to the left of, the, of this particular part. Okay, let's talk about the formal definition of the period t of a function. What is the formal mathematical definition? We're going to say the following. We say that t is the period of a function f if and only if f of x plus t equals f of x for all the numbers x in the x-axis. If a function f has a period, a period t, we say that f is a periodic function. So if a function has a period, and what that means is that there is there exists a number t for which this particular constraint is satisfied then that then such function is called a periodic function so a periodic function is a function that has a period and a period is a number t for which f of x plus t equals f of x what does this mean in the context of this example well as you can see guys the function is being re re uh, re repeated over uh, over a lapse of four units. Can you see all of these 
you know, one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four. Every single bit of four units makes the function uh, repeat, basically. So what? So basically, what we know just from from considering the graph, we know that the that the period is is four just by looking at the graph, just by looking over what span of the of the x-axis this is four. The function is being repeated just by looking at the graph. We don't have to do any arithmetic or any algebra or any analysis. But let's see if this if this period of four actually satisfies this definition that f of x plus t equals f of x. Okay, look, consider this this value f of three equals three, which is this particular point f of three equals three. Now if if the period is 4, then I should have, I should have, I must have that f of 3 plus the period is going to be equal to f of 3. According to this, I'm making, I'm basically, when I write this, I'm making use of this, uh, of this constraint or this uh, rule or this definition for the particular value of x being equal to 3. Okay, I'm deciding x is going to be 3. Let's consider x equals 3. Then, if this is true, this must be true. In other words, f of 7 needs to be equal to f of 3. Is that true? Let's see. f of 7 is right here. f of 7 is 3, which is the same as f of 3. f of 7 is uh, 4, 5, 6, 7. This is 7 right here. And as you can see, it has the same value than f of 3. This is 3. This is 7. And they, they have the same values. which is, They have the same output, which is 3 in this case. And the same is going to happen for any other value in, in the x-axis. If you consider this value, which is minus 2, then add 4, add the period to this value, and you're going to have the same output. What is the output for minus 2? The output is 2, as we can see clearly. For, for minus 2, the output is 2. Well, for minus 2 plus 4, which is equal to 2, we have the same output once again. Can you see? The number 2. So that's that's what uh, that's what the period is, guys. The period is a number such that satisfies this particular equation. This is a very important equation for us. Okay, and if there is such a number, if there exists a number t with that property, that f of x plus t equals f of x, then we call t the period, and we call f a periodic function. That is the formal definition. Okay, so let's go. Let's go here now. The period t of f of x equals sine of x is two pi. We have already uh, demonstrated that in the workbook. Now let's let's see very quickly why. Can we actually prove that that this two pi is actually the period of this function? Yes. Yes, we can. Because all we need to do is this. All we need to do is prove that f of x equals f of x plus 2 pi. If I say that 2 pi is a period t, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be having, well, if you want, let's write that. Well, no, let's keep it that way. I'm just writing this in, uh, in reversed order, but it's the same, right? If I say that 2 pi is t for sine of x, then I must have that sine of x equals sine of x plus 2 pi. Now, how can I prove this? How can I prove that this is true? Well, I stick to the rules that I've already taught you for the sign of the addition of angles. And this is going to be equal to sine of x times the cosine of 2 pi. Radians, remember, all of these are in radians. And uh, plus the sine of 2 pi times the cosine of x. This is a, a, a theorem, a, a law 
you uh, you have already managed this. I know that you don't memorize it. It's okay. Don't worry. So cosine of two pi is zero. No, it's one. That's an exercise from the workbook. And sine of two pi is zero, making all of this equal to zero. Therefore, we have sine of x times one sine of x. This is zero, so all of this doesn't matter anymore. And we have proven. Since we have arrived at a, at, a, at a truth, we have proven that 2 pi is in fact the period for the function sine of x. Okay, you already did that before. Now, what is what we have to do now? Uh, what's the period of a function such as f of x equals sine of a times x, where a is any number in the, in the real numbers? So I didn't want to specify any particular number. And in, 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 in order to do that, we have to sp uh, just put a variable, okay? Like sine of a times x. a is any real number, except zero, of course. a cannot be zero because otherwise we would not have any function at all. So what is the period of this function, guys? Sine of some number, some constant, times x. Let's find out. We're going to use an approach very similar to this. So what's going to be the period for, for this function? Well, let me write the whole thing. For f of x equals sine of some number a, some constant. It could be 3, it could be 2, it could be 1 half, it could be whatever, times x. What's the period for this? It's not going to be 2 pi. Let me tell you right away. Even though the period for sine of x is 2 pi, the period for any function other than uh, any function like this is going to be different than 2 pi, unless a is 1, of course, because if a is 1, you would be having this. Okay, so let's see. Let's find out the period t for this function. So if we have a period for this function, what we must have is that f of x should be equal to f of x plus t. That is the definition of the period. The period t is any number such that this equation is satisfied. What is f of x though? f of x is equal to sine of ax and f of x plus t is sine of a times x plus t. Okay, this is the way you should write that, write it down. Do not make the mistake of writing this, sine of ax plus t. That would be wrong. That would be wrong. It must be written like, like this. Okay. So, uh, let's simplify this a little, a little bit. Let's simplify this. Or let's actually expand this multiplication. We have this a times x plus a times t. There you go. And now what I can do is something similar to what I did before. I know the rule for the sign of the addition of two angles, in this case ax and in this case at. First angle, second angle, we have a plus in the middle, so I can use this law sine of ax times the cosine of at plus the sine of at times the cosine of ax okay so this is the way it's going to it's going to this is the way it's going to look now look at all of these guys uh, at this equation we have sine of ax equals all of this if I want this side and this side to be actually the same, what I need is this. If you if you notice, uh, I already have sine of sine of ax right here, which is the same as this. So if if all of this was equal to one and all of this stuff was equal to zero, then I would be having a, a true equivalence or a true equation by having this all of this equal to one 
and all of this equal to zero. So I need cosine of AT. I need it to be equal to one. That's the first thing I need. How can I accomplish that? What value should T have? What value should should I give to T so that cosine of AT is equal to one? Well, if you remember, the cosine is equal to one when this value in here is either zero, well, not zero degrees, zero, zero radians, or two pi radians. I hope you remember that. Check that out, please. Cosine of zero equals one, and cosine of two pi radians equals one. Okay, we're gonna choose this one, this particular value. Cosine of two pi equals one. I know that, I know that. So, if all of this thing inside the parentheses was equal to two pi, then I would be I would be having a true equivalence. So basically what I need is for a t to be equal to two pi. And what that means is that t should be equal to two pi over a. So when t equals two pi over a, when I give the value of two pi over a to this particular t, all of this becomes one, which is what I wanted. Now, is, could this same value for, for the period t, which is two pi over a, could this per particular value also give me that all of this is zero? Let's find out. For example, let's substitute this value, two pi over a, right here, and let's see what happens. Sine of a times t, which is this, times two pi over a, how much is this, guys? This is going to be equal to sine. Uh, this and this cancel one another. Sine of 2 pi. Uh, grab your calculator, put it in radians, and you're going to find out that the sine of 2 pi is going to be equal to 0. Sine of 2 pi, radians, equals 0. So all of this is 0, and 0 times anything, I don't care what it is, it's going to give me 0. So this particular value, 2 pi over a, also fulfills this other part. So basically, we, we have found the period of this particular function. Any function of the form sine of any number a times x. When you have a function of this shape, sine of some number times x, then you know immediately that the period is going to be equal to 2 pi over a. It's kind of like a formula. Can you see? So let's let's put it to use. What if I give you this function? Okay, let's talk about one of the functions that we had at the beginning. For example, the number number 2. The function number 2 was this. 1 third times the sine of 2x. Don't pay attention to this one third because this only changes the amplitude. It doesn't change the, the period. The only thing that can change the period is this number here. So if we have this function, and if I'm looking for the period of this function, then I can just apply this rule. I'm gonna divide, I'm gonna have this, two pi, and I'm gonna divide it over a. What is a? It is a number that multiplies x. In this case, it's 2. So the period is 2 pi over 2, which is pi. There you go. This is the peri period of this particular function. Let's, let's make sure. Please memorize it. 1 third times sine of 2x. And I'm telling you that the period of this function is pi. It's no longer 2 pi. For sine of x is 2 pi, for this function is just pi. So memorize all of this or write it down and let's see if that's true. Let's go to Desmos. Let's invent another function. Let's call it f of x again. One third times sine. Let me erase all of the other graphs. 
well let's skip this one the original uh, to X there you go well let me let me dispense with the first one for a moment so what was the the period for these guys it was pi in other words it was three point about three about three about three point one let's see if that's true let's see so the function begins right here and it traces the s can you see and it finishes right here so that that is that is the behavior of the function from zero to pi or about 3.15 and then from here from this particular point you get the same behavior once again look it goes like this 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 s and then once again up until about 2 pi well no 2 pi which is about 6 and then you get the same behavior over and over again every pi which is this is 1 pi this is 2 pi this is 3 pi etc so the period for this function is pi it's shortened with respect to the primitive function can you see this is the primitive function whose period was 2 pi and this is the changed or transformed function which has a period of just pi you can also say this this function has two cycles for every cycle of this can you see like look one cycle of the primitive is this this is one cycle there you go once again one cycle and this one since the period is half of, of the pre period of this it's gonna have two cycles uh, in, in such in such span look one cycle two cycles Okay, that's how it works guys okay let me stop right there I think that was a lot of a lot of talk and let's get down to questions or exercises